Hello everyone, welcome to the DH Education Podcast, your program to be updated on the digital heritage education domain. I'm your host, Raul Gomez Hernandez, and I'm glad to be here with you. In this fourth episode, we will talk with Zoe Smith about how important it's for creatives to have the opportunity of producing digital educational resources for young people, how digital heritage material for educational purposes have been developed, how does methodology change from an institution to another, how to imply audiences on the developing process. Stay to the end and discover some innovative projects and book recommendations to explore more around this topic. Since some years, the cultural and creative industries are widely understood as an important key point of support for inclusive and sustainable economic growth and employment in the European Union. The European Commission, within the framework of its Europe 2020 strategy, started in 2012 with new policies as programs and initiatives to promote creativity and innovation as the only way to face the new challenges and deal with social needs. The cultural and creative industries are part of these programs as well, benefiting from Creative Europe Horizon 2020, Erasmus+, Plus, Erasmus+, Plus for young entrepreneurs, and the European Structural and Investment Funds. In the case of cultural heritage, along with the programs and initiatives launched by the European Union, the European Framework for Action on Cultural Heritage was established in 2018. As a result of the efficient development of these programs in the cultural sector, according to Eurostat, the number of cultural enterprises in the EU27 were more than 1 million, represented by an average of 5.1% of the total number of enterprises in the non-financial business economy of the EU27. Also, their contribution to the value was by an average of 2.3% and the turnover was 1.5% of the total turnover generated in 2017. Apart from the growth in the number of cultural enterprises related to the cultural heritage sector with high ad value and turnover, some projects from the Creative Europe program were highlighted for improving the management and safeguarding of cultural heritage in European cities. In the educational aspect, some projects participate every year on these programs for the dissemination of cultural heritage in primary and secondary education. Now, let me propose some questions. Are the cultural heritage institutions aware of the relevance of having creative professionals in their teams and working together with external enterprises? Are there initiatives and guidelines for supporting creativity and innovation in museums? This week, I would like to talk with Zoe Smith about Hello, Zoe. Thank you very much for being here in this four episode. Thanks for having me. Very pleased to chat with you today. Let me introduce yourself a bit to the audience. Zoe Smith is a content producer, writer and editor based in London, United Kingdom. She studied French and Italian at the University College of London and has an MA in publishing from the University of the Arts, London. After working as a junior editor and digital content developer for the Quarto Group, and Pearson respectively. Since 2016, she has worked as a digital content producer, specializing in producing engaging educational content for kids and families in the museum and gallery wall. From 2016 to 2019, Zoe produced educational content for the Royal Academy of Arts, and since 2019, she has worked for Tate in London, managing Tate Kids, its website for kids to learn about art. From your experience working as a digital content producer, how important is it for you to have the opportunity for producing digital educational resources for young people? Sure. So I would say that through my role at Take Kids, everything I do is about creating resources for young people. And in previous roles as well, it's been a lot about creating educational content. I work in the digital team at Tate. So I manage Take Kids, as you said in your introduction, uh, which is a website for five to 13 year olds, um, which includes games, quizzes, articles about art and artists and video. So I produce quite a lot of video can- content in my current role. And I would say that my mission at Tate is to make art more accessible to a really diverse range of young people um, and to inspire kids to learn about art and to make them curious to, to learn more in the future. I definitely see Take Kids as the beginning of a lot of kids' journeys in understanding and learning more about art. And every piece of content that 
I create there is all about having an educational aspect but making sure that it's very accessible because I think there's a bit of a um, disconnect sometimes between something that you might see as an educational resource that a teacher might use and then an educational resource that a kid or young person might find interesting themselves and that they might see as something that is less formal. So that's why I think Take Kids is a really interesting place to work because the most popular part of the website are the games and quizzes. So those are definitely places where kids come independently. But also I think we have quite a lot of teachers and parents kind of recommending the site and encouraging kids to use the site and they like it because it seems fun for kids. So I think a lot of my work is about finding that sweet spot that exists between um, a more formal education setting um, and the gatekeepers to those settings as well as a more kid first less formal learning environment where kids can kind of explore make their own choices uh, question things get things wrong um, and have that space to do so that's a really interesting reflection Zoe about how your work is in dead kids and creative producing educational content as it was explaining before, you have worked at the Royal Academy of Arts, and now you work for Tate. Could you explain to the audience which is your methodology for developing digital education materials? Does it change depending on the decision you work? Mm. So at Take Kids, I have a number of content principles that I try to weave through every piece of content that I create, and I kind of use those as guiding principles. So. All of the content that I create is meant to be evergreen. So by that, I mean content which does not have a particular shelf life. It won't you know, be irrelevant within two years or irrelevant if an exhibition closes. It often relates to the collection at Tate, which we're very lucky is a fabulous collection that spans hundreds of years of British and international art. Um, so we have a lot to work with. But uh, yes, it often links to the collection, which um, means that it is more evergreen and has a longer um, life on the website and can be continually relevant for users over a long period of time. I also try to always make content that reflects artists, art terms or artworks in the collection. And, and I think that kind of defines what that link to the collection kind of means. I also try to make all of my content decisions quite data led. So working for a website, uh, we obviously use analytics, um, but we also talk to our audience quite a lot and we find out what kids are thinking about. We look at trends. We also talk to teachers and parents and find out what uh, content would be interesting to them. So we kind of have that uh, dual audience that I kind of spoke about earlier of parents, teachers and kids themselves. So we try to involve them in the content that we make. Yeah, as I said, making data led decisions is important because if you're making something for the audience, you need to know what that audience is enjoying that you're already making, uh, what they're not enjoying, what they're looking at, what's engaging, where people are spending time on the website and things like that. So those would definitely be some of the top content priorities, but we also make sure that all of our content is fun and creative and playful, uh, as well as being educational. It's also important that the content is safe and accessible. So maybe those are two quite different things, but by safe, I mean, we make sure that Take Kids is an environment that is safe for children to use independently. So we're thinking about safeguarding in terms of, uh, there's a gallery on Take Kids where kids can send their work. Um, and we moderate that quite closely so that artworks that we present on the site are safe for other children to see and to enjoy. Um, and that can be a sort of place for kids to almost talk to one another in a moderated, safe environment. And by accessible, I guess I mean we want to create content that is suitable in terms of tone of voice, suitable in terms of readability, accessible in terms of reading age and the sort of appropriateness uh, of the content that we're creating in terms of how old a child needs to be to be able to enjoy it. We also make sure that um, content that we create is diverse and it showcases the work and perspectives of artists from marginalized and underrepresented groups. Uh, so we want to make sure that that's kind of on screen and off screen is one way of saying it. So not all of our content is film content, but we think quite hard about the stories that we are representing and making sure that we're getting a divorce, diverse 
broad range of stories represented. So of those for people from different backgrounds, so BAME backgrounds and communities, LGBTQ plus communities, and people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, disabled artists. So that kind of implies, involves off-screen and on-screen diversity. So thinking about the stories that we present, but also the people that we hire to kind of help tell those stories and making sure that that's authentic. We also want to make sure that we're representing children's voices um, and their art and ideas. So making sure that children are involved in the production of some pieces of content where it's relevant and making sure that we are really like tapping into what they're interested in seeing on Take Kids. So we want to inspire creativity offline as well as online. So we think quite hard about the amount of screen time that kids um, are involved in these days and how the activities we're presenting feed into that and how we can make the space one that encourages kids to go away and do more analog activities away from the screen as well. Um, and I would also say that everything that Take Kids creates and that I produce is iterative. So that means we are always trying to learn from what we've already done and we look at how things are performing. And then if something hasn't worked, we change direction and we make improvements and we're kind of constantly looking and analysing how our content's performing and how we can make it better. It's really great to see that there are lots of strategies related with social values and participation of young people in connection with the interests of the project. Also, as you mentioned, about thinking what your audience needs is a must. The cultural heritage institutions should know, for example, as you say, creating content for using online and offline, because it's a really good option these days. Yeah. And I think it's really important to be audience led. And I would say the whole of our digital team is very audience led. We're always thinking about our audiences and looking at where they're already going and what content they're already enjoying and how we can add something to that. Um, you know, we see our competitors as other museums who are producing content for children and young people, but also all of the other content providers that are providing content for kids uh, to, you know, TV channels, other websites, um, apps, different platforms that children are accessing, and then also all of their offline interests and activities as well. So we're kind of, we're kind of bustling in that very busy space, looking for um, a way to produce something that's different and interesting to children, whether that is through uh, something that is very educational and therefore we kind of reach the children through more formal education channels or whether kids are kind of coming to the website themselves. Yeah, I agree with you. It's really difficult to engage with young people when there are more options available, like TV channels or video games. So any tool like digital storytelling, games or quizzes used to get the young people engaged with digital cultural heritage is always welcome. Well, we have talked about your methods and how motivated you are for producing the digital educational content. Let's speak now about participation. According to your experience producing educational content and what we have been talking about before, could you tell the audience listening to this podcast how you employ your audiences, teachers or other group of people in the developing process of the learning materials? Uh, yeah, so I can speak a little bit about that. We have a few different ways that we talk to our audiences and obviously depends uh, who that audience is. So, for example, um, we think quite a lot about teachers as a secondary audience and especially during the um, pandemic, during COVID-19 over the past year where schools have been closed and a lot of parents have also been taking on that role of teacher in the home. Um, we've been thinking a lot about how we can provide content that's really useful for teachers and for parents homeschooling. So we conducted a survey with teachers through um, an e-bulletin that Tate sends out to teachers. Uh, and I think it's really important with with surveys to think carefully about what you want to find out and what your objectives are because I think a lot of uh, museums and institutions send surveys out uh, quite freely and I think it's there's real value in making sure that it's a cohesive effort and making sure that you understand what you're trying to get out of that research. So this most recent example I have is we sent a survey out uh, yeah, through the e-bulletin at Tate to teachers who were already engaged in Tate activities. So they had already signed up to this 
e-bulletin um, which does mean that those are teachers that are already very engaged in what we do which is worth bearing in mind when you think about what they're going to say um, but we were asking them about what they wanted in terms of content during lockdown and while schools were closed because we wanted to create some content that would be really useful to them so we were thinking about a live experience we produced two lives during the summer last year in 2020 where an artist or presenter presented an activity um, and it was a, a live stream that went on for about 45 minutes and they brought in artworks from the collection and presented a, a physical making activity. We wanted to do a third one later in the year once schools had actually reopened and we were um, very conscious that it was a different moment in time so we wanted to ask teachers what would actually be useful after that initial kind of lockdown uh, and while schools were actually open at the time what would be more useful to them then um, so what we got back was quite interesting um, and it was really good to have the teachers insights because I think we can spend a lot of time in cultural institutions and museums and galleries thinking about uh, formal educational, formal education settings like schools um, and without actually spending any time there um, and without necessarily having experience teaching. I think it's really important to talk, to talk often to your audience. Um, so yeah, this survey definitely made us change direction. We had um, information from teachers that actually a live stream wasn't really useful to them because they couldn't fit it into their working day, into the school day. That was actually going to be a bit of a barrier to a lot of teachers if we if we created that that form of content. So we took what they said and decided to do uh, a pre-recorded session instead. Um, and as I said, yes, yeah, surveys are definitely one way to do that kind of communication with an audience. It really depends who they are, though. And I know that a lot of teachers won't have responded to that survey because they are just so pushed for time. Um, and I think that's one thing that we definitely know about the audience, as well as the fact that they whatever you produce if they like it, then they will use it. But it has to be useful to them. Um, and they as a group, I think I would from just my experience working in in the field of museum education i think i do know about teachers that they are very pushed for time and that they can adapt resources um, and i think the format of the resources is quite important so that it can be something that they can for example if it's a video that they can stop and start and then that they can add the surrounding padding necessary to that video for their class because they are the experts at sort of knowing the people that they are teaching the young people that they are teaching and what they need so any content provider providing educational um, material or videos or online resources is not necessarily going to get it right for every child um, and it's the teacher that has that knowledge and can adapt add to pad around um, provide context for the the resources that we create on take kids for example so i think um it's definitely worth bearing those things in mind we also talk to kids themselves and have focus groups with kids especially when we're creating a sort of a new series or uh, a videos or a new game for example in game production we make sure that we have quite a lot of user testing with children um we also sometimes have specific pieces of content where we want to showcase kids voices and um, give them a platform. I can think of one example recently where we had a group of school children come in from a local school to see a display at Tate Britain and then we did an art workshop and during that art workshop uh, we listened to what the children were saying about what they'd seen and we created a piece of content using what they had told us about what they liked and what they didn't like what stood out to them and I think that's a really nice way to make sure that someone like me is still is in touch with children from local schools and in touch with the audience in that way I think it's really important to have that regularly just to kind of remind you who you're making content for I mean our audience as I said before is quite global so uh, about 50% of our audience during lockdown was from the US which we can tell from Google Analytics while Tate is for three galleries across the UK so no it's for I'm thinking of like the London sites as one but there's Tate Modern, Tate Britain 
Tate Liverpool and Tate St. Ives. And I actually, the digital team and I work across all of those sites. The US audience is about 50% of our total audience. Um, and though the, the Tate is four galleries across the UK, um, you know, not all of our audience are in the UK and we have to constantly bear that in mind. Um, we haven't done any co-creation co um, currently with like a US audience or a more global audience, but that is something I'm definitely interested in looking into because I think it's really important that we understand the needs, not just of, you know, children and young people in the UK and what they're interested in, but also children and young people in America and in other English speaking countries who are in like the top five countries using our site as well as Spain as well. Um, so I think it's definitely worth thinking on a more global scale and uh, it's a bit of a question mark how to achieve that I guess at the moment. Um, and I think one of the real challenges in terms of involving people in creating materials and videos and uh, other resources on Take Kids is that with surveys as I mentioned, and with, for example, a focus group, it's it's a challenge to get access to people um, or to sort of get engage, engagement from people who don't know anything about Tate, who don't have the brand awareness of what Tate does. They don't, they're not interested in art. They wouldn't necessarily bring their kids to an art museum or they are kids themselves who have never been to a gallery, for example. Um, I think so in the past I've done focus groups with families um, to, to learn more about what they thought about a particular resource, for example, when I did at the Royal Academy of Arts and it, all the people that signed up to the focus group were people that really liked the Royal Academy of Arts. They really liked the family program. So they had so much positivity and engagement already that what the feedback we got from them was also positive that it's almost not that useful um, and I think when you're thinking about creating content for a diverse range of people and to uh, for people who are not that confident in talking about art and they don't go to galleries very much and the, you know or for a child whose only experience of going to a gallery might be like um, a school trip that they were taken on I think the challenge is that you want to create content for those people and you want to bring them in and you want to open Tate out to them. But in focus groups and, you know, surveys to e-bulletins to people that are already signed up um, and who are already listening to what your institution is saying, you know, it's just quite different. You're going to get a different range of people and you're already sort of getting people who understand what you do rather than, you know, finding the people who you might need to talk to because they're the people that you want to reach. I agree with you. It's really important to connect with them, to know the teacher needs and the young audience's interests. You work also with families and it's a really good opportunity to know what they think and how they use the content you produce. Also, these audiences who are not familiarized with cultural heritage is a potential audience. To end this talk, could you give a tip to our audience for creating better digital education resources for engaging with young people and these audiences who are not connected with galleries and museums so far? Sure, I mean, uh, it's kind of hard to think of just one tip. But I suppose the most important thing, I think, is to keep your content priorities at the forefront of your mind when creating content and to only produce things that, to, that meet your mission and that, that meet your content priorities. So, you know, if you're saying that every piece of content you create, you want it to be kid first, kid focused, to be suitable for the age range that you're looking at, then that will really come through in the things that you create. Um, I think I mentioned all the content priorities or some of the ones that I try and make all the content uh, relate to. But I think, I think it is really important to have all of that at the front of your mind when creating content because it's so easy to, especially in a large organization, um, be influenced by different stakeholders within an institution or um, externally. But I think if you have a mission that you're trying to achieve, for example, making content that's super accessible to a diverse range of people, um, that's fun, creative and playful, then you can make sure that everything you create is fun, creative and playful and does speak to those audiences that you want to reach. Um, so it might sound a bit obvious, but I think just keeping those content priorities uh, front and center in everything that you do and everything that you create, then 
you're bound to have more success. But I also think the flip side of that is perhaps a tip would be to be adaptable and to be uh, agile, to, to, to iterate what you do and to be able to change if something isn't working. So to keep those content priorities at the top of your mind, but also to be flexible enough to change and to really interrogate those content priorities as you move forwards and to, to change if something isn't working, whether that's the content or the priorities themselves. That's right. It's really important to prioritize the goals of the project, but also to involve and work with all the stakeholders as teachers, families, and all your audiences as they are going to use your material and work with your content. So it's needed to get all this input back. The institution should take care of the relationship with the audiences, and it goes farther than making content that could be funny. These audiences are going to keep your content alive for a time, and I think it's going to be always with them. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, to establish, if you're starting out, you know, if you're a new team within a digital uh, with, within an institution, within a gallery or a museum or another cultural institution, if you're like a new digital team or a new branch of a digital team that is trying to create content for young people specifically, then in order to decide what your content priorities are, you absolutely need to talk to your audiences um, as well as you know, I mentioned stakeholders, I guess I meant more people within your institution who might have opinions or ideas about what that audience needs or what internal needs are, because I think that is quite important in big institutions. There's a lot of different moving parts. You have all these different teams. You have people who are experts in the field of curatorial and research and maybe schools and teachers and family programs that are, you know, in person. But I think uh, the digital team needs to take on board what those stakeholders think and but also just prioritize the audience and make sure that those content priorities that you're going to set up um, your content production with are ones that have had input from the audiences you're trying to reach. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to talk with you and know more about the procession from a digital producer. No worries, thank you for having me. If you would like to learn more about how to boost creativity and innovation in the cultural heritage sector, I recommend you this week a guide published by the Wax Society in Amsterdam titled Hacking Culture, a guide for hackathons in the cultural sector, edited by Yvonne Jansen Dinks, Dick Van Dix and Roland Van Vesten in 2017. Explore this toolkit and learn how to use hackathons in the cultural heritage sector to develop innovative ideas for any topic. To take a deeper approach around how creative decisions in cultural heritage generate a positive effect on the local economic development, I suggest you to read the book published by the Edward Elgar Paulson titled Cultural Heritage, Creativity and Economic Development, written by Silvia Sarisola in 2019. If you want to know a European project working on creative strategies in the cultural heritage, I recommend you visit the Creative Heritage Project website. This project aims to develop new ways and initiatives to communicate and promote cultural heritage for purposes such as regional development, tourism and citizen cultural participation. The researchers have developed a handbook and a toolkit you can find in this website. Another powerful project is the Arts and Humanities Entrepreneurship Hub. It aims to develop an adaptable arts and humanities entrepreneurship model for students with training and networking with different stakeholders. Thank you very much for being today with Zoe Smith and me in this podcast. Next week, a new expert will come and a new topic will be. Find all the resources from the topic we talk about in this podcast on the resource section of the DH Education blog. If you like this podcast, Subscribe to the YouTube channel, share with your colleagues, follow the podcast on Spotify, iBox, or any platform you listen to, and follow the project on social media. See you next week!